Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming to hear me. This is the first time I, I come to Microsoft Research, so something I wanted to do for a long time. And don't worry, she will get you better speakers from those people in New York. But um, for the moment, you have me. Um, so um, this is a strange story: the trouble with physics and. I'm going to take a route to it. The book took a long time to write, and it's, there are sort of four books intermeshed in it. And so it's not a simple thing to condense down into less than an hour. And it also, I mean, you know, there's a sound bite which is string theory is in trouble, oh my god, or there is this horrible critic of string theory, oh my god, or something like that. Um, let me take you through how I would like to present it. And, and it's always also a little strange, I mean, having done this twice before, because you work for years to write a book, to say, to think through. And, and I, I'm not a popularizer. I mean, I'm a scientist. And I the books, each of them came from an attempt to think through something that was bothering me very much and driving me crazy in the work that I mainly do, which is quantum gravity. and. Um, And so it's, it's a little bit strange. You put a lot of time into thinking through the issues and having a coherent set of arguments, which you work hard on. And then you write it, and then you think, oh, I'm done. And people will go out and read it if they want. And hopefully they consider carefully the arguments that you make. And then you find yourself going out and explaining it to people. So here's my version of the book. Um, and then you read reviews and stuff. And there's all kinds of versions of a book like this. So. One place the book starts, and I'll be referring to some of the other starting points, because the book has several roots into it, um, is with a crisis that many of us on uh, my generation feel in theoretical physics. I'm a member of the first generation trained since the standard model of theoretical physics, or standard model of particle physics was developed in 1973. And we feel a sense of crisis because the big problems in fundamental physics that are faced now are the same problems that we were told about when we started undergraduate school in the 1970s. So there are five big questions, and I'm going to tell you about those five big questions. And then the sense of crisis comes from the fact that we still don't know the answer to any of them. Okay. The first, and the one that I mostly work on, is how to unify or bring together quantum mechanics and general relativity. And this is kind of a pop, I, I understand that most of you are technically sophisticated. Actually, how many people here are just, are also physicists? Okay, so the, 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 the word, are there no equations in this talk? This is a talk for a broad audience, um, but there's a lot of subtext that you can think about. Okay, so, but you may know, some, some people may know some of this. So we have had quantum mechanics since 1926. We've had general relativity since 1916. They together describe all the phenomena that we know about experimentally, but there are certainly phenomena in the world, and I'll be telling you about some of them, in which to understand and make predictions regarding them, you need both quantum phenomena and general relativistic phenomenon, and the question is, can they be put together? The second question, which goes back to the 1920s and indeed before quantum mechanics was fully formulated, is what the hell does this mean? Does it make any sense? As many of you undoubtedly know, there's been a controversy about whether quantum mechanics can be regarded as really a fundamental framework for physics, fully acceptable, or whether it's some kind of intermediate step towards that. Many of its founders, like Einstein and de Broglie and Schrodinger, uh, 
believed that quantum mechanics was provisional and was flawed because it provides only a statistical description of experiments because there's this peculiar thing where you treat evolution when you're not measuring a system and evolution when you're measuring it completely differently, um, which suggests that it's maybe just a partial approximate description of a subsystem. So that's the second question, either to make sense of quantum mechanics or to find a deeper theory that underlies it. The standard model of particle physics is a description of the strong, weak, and electromagnetic interactions, but it doesn't fully unify them, and it certainly doesn't unify them with gravity. So there's been an ambition that perhaps the, big, the four forces are really somehow different aspects of one fundamental interaction. There are also in the standard model different kinds of particles. There are quarks. There are leptons, which come then into charged leptons, electrons, muons, and tau, and neutrinos. And there is a hypothesis that maybe these are just different states of one kind of fundamental particle, different states of excitations or something. And there's also an idea, I mean, why do we have two kinds of things, particles and forces, um, which in quantum theory becomes fermions and bosons? Um, could there be just one kind of entity. So this is the issue of unification. Okay, that's the third question. The fourth question has to do with questions that the standard model of particle physics answers. The standard model is confirmed to a lot of precision in every experiment that's been done since then. All that has had to be changed is to add parameters to describe the fact that we now know neutrinos have mass whereas when it was written down, we had no evidence for neutrino masses. But as good as the standard model is, it has a long list of free parameters which are set from experiment. These include the masses of all the particles that I was telling you about, the strengths of the different forces, and a bunch of others having to do with phenomena like mixing, decays, and so forth. All together, including the fact that neutrinos have mass, there are 29 free parameters which are set from experiment. It's obvious that a more fundamental unification or by any means a more fundamental understanding of the physics in the standard model should explain some of those parameters and reduce the numbers of free parameters. So that's the fourth problem. The fifth problem is what is the dark is really two, what is the dark matter, and what is the dark energy. Um, in the 1970s, we only knew about the dark matter. There was evidence beginning to be gathered. Actually, from Zwicky in the 1930s, it was already known that most of the matter holding together clusters of galaxies was not ordinary visible matter. Ver Rubin, during I think the late 60s and early 1970s, developed strong evidence which was then confirmed in many, many studies of many galaxies that you needed additional matter to account for the motions of stars in galaxies, if you assume Newton's laws. And so there's been the problem of either what is the dark matter or are the laws of gravity, Newton's laws and by extension Einstein's equations, modified at galactic scales so as to get agreement. I mean, there's this remarkable thing that Newton's laws are very reliable on solar system scales and below, and then when you apply them to the galaxy, if you believe you know where the visible matter is, you don't account for the orbits of the stars in the galaxies, and you don't account for the binding of clusters of galaxies into what seem to be bind systems. Um, so this is the problem of the dark matter. On top of that, in 1978, it was discovered that there is a dark energy. What that means is that's a form of matter density playing a role in the expansion of the universe where the pressure is negative and in magnitude equal to minus the energy density, which is a very unusual form of matter density. And evidence for that 
was discovered and it's just gotten better and better, for better or worse, since 1998. It was totally unexpected, unwanted, as I'll be saying, um, caused a crisis for some people. Um, so that's the fifth question. Okay, so those are my five questions. That's what the rest of the talk is about. Some of us, and not just a few marginal people, but many of us are worried that physics is in a crisis because we have not made definitive progress on any of these problems in spite of concerted attention of basically between them the whole community of people who think about what are the laws of nature um, for at least three decades. Some of them go back much further, like the problem of quantum gravity. Um, and one of the roots into this book is worrying about that. Now, a second root, for me particularly, was worry about what science is and how science works. And I want to motivate that just by the fact that we face a situation where hard work by thousands of you know, the best selected, best trained physicists we've had in the history of science have not cracked those problems. And so maybe we should go back and think about what science is and how it works. If that's not enough of a motivation, um, to think about that, um, more motivation is coming in the talk. Now, um, we start off as little babies looking around, and apparently at our hands is the first thing, and you know, you know they shouldn't let fathers in the delivery room, but that's what happens um, with a camera. And then we grow up and we become scientists in the tradition of Galileo, and in the tradition of Galileo, we have had an amazing 400 years where there's been exponentially accumulated steady progress at understanding all domains of nature we have access to experimentally. It's an incredible success story. So why? How does it work? Well, a lot of you here are researchers, and you know whatever it is that you do, that research is a messy, nonlinear, unpredictable, non-methodical thing. Some of us were taught in high school that there's a method for science, and some people even taught that in college courses. Um, it turns out that there isn't a method for science that seems worth anything. And this is, in fact, an issue that philosophers of science, and I'm not going to dwell on this, but if, I, if somebody wants in the question period, I can because it's an avocation of mine. Um, through the 20th century, there's been an intense discussion amongst philosophers about what science is and why it works. And a succession of philosophers, Karl Popper, Thomas Kuhn, Paul Feyerabend, and Irma Larkatosh, and that only takes us to the 70s, and then there's a bunch of people after that, um, have convincingly shown that the progress of science cannot be accounted for by saying that we scientists have access to a method that when we follow it leads to truth. Okay. So how does it work? And again, it's a whole talk, in fact, it's a whole graduate course in philosophy of science, how, how strong those arguments are, that case is that there's no method. But let's take it as established and go on and ask. Okay. So I have a proposal for why it works so well, and that proposal frames the discussions that are coming later about controversy in science. And that's that in any field, we researchers, we scientists, form communities of people which are voluntary associations that we join, and we join by giving loyalty to a certain set of ethics about how to treat each other and how to find truth. Okay. And these are what I think those basic principles are. And it's very simple, it's not even maybe worth stating, but I'm going to need it later on to discuss the present controversies. Okay. First, if they're in those cases where there is a question, a hypothesis, or a disagreement which can be settled 
by rational deduction from public evidence, it must be regarded as settled. Even if I'm, I prefer aesthetically or for philosophically or for whatever reasons, those accounts of dark matter would say actually it's a modification of the laws of gravity. Okay. When, for example, has happened about a month ago with something called the bullet cluster, somebody comes up with strong observational evidence that rules out all those theories and strongly shows us that there is that where the gravitational force is coming from is not where the matter is, not where the visible matter is, so there is dark matter, then I have to give up and say, you were right, I was wrong, the evidence is persuasive. The second one, the second principle, is that in those cases where the evidence is not or is not yet sufficient, sufficiently persuasive or unambiguous to lead to consensus among experts, Okay. And we're talking about uh, not we're not we're talking about a community of well-trained experts, by the way, because to join this community you have to have the skills needed to make persuasive cases for your work to other skeptical experts. So we're not talking about people coming from completely outside of science, but when well-trained experts disagree and can come to consensus, we have to agree to disagree. And in fact, we have to encourage exploration of all the different avenues that experts want to investigate because this is science. I realize I have this thing. Okay. So obvious points, because we don't know what the answer is when we face stubborn, hard problems, we want to diversify and investigate not any arbitrary thing that might come to somebody's mind, but anything which is well motivated from the point of view of somebody who's familiar with the situation. Sure. Well, there should be a sense of crisis. Say, mathematicians couldn't solve Fermat, couldn't prove Fermat theorem for a couple of centuries, and there was no sense of crisis. Wait, but, uh, wait, wait, wait. wait. Yeah. Some more. Also, according to Kuhn, which you quoted, you know, each science has certain life. So physics may be how we can solve it. Well, <laughs> maybe the, uh, the last thing I'm not going to speculate about. Uh, we have what we have what we have. Um, um, some problems in mathematics continually get solved. Okay? Some problems are unsolved for long periods of time. Similarly, in physics, going back, and I, don't, I can rehearse this with you if you like, but if you can go back to the 1820s, and make a timeline and see every decade a definitive advance in what you would call our fundamental understanding of the laws of nature. Okay. So maybe three decades without that isn't enough to completely go crazy, but it's the working careers of a large number of people and we worry. Maybe we're wrong, let's see if I can persuade you. Okay? Okay, so this is, so part of the reason for the second principle is that we don't know what the right answer is and we should avoid coming prematurely to agreement because in the long run the evidence might point in a different direction. Okay. Now, I want to talk about the area of quantum gravity which is the area that I mostly work in and it's also interesting as an example of an unsolved problem and as an example of the role of controversy in science because the disagreements in the area of quantum gravity reflect long-standing disagreements about how to answer the question about what is the nature of space and time. So if you're interested in characterizing how science works, one question that those two principles bring out is how does science move from a situation where there's controversy and conflicting hypotheses to a point where there's consensus. And this is an interesting case because the controversies go back centuries. So two of, I, I called this section Three Roads to Quantum Gravity, which is the title of, of the second book I wrote, and two of those roads, I'll come to the third road at the end, two of those roads go back to the 17th century and come from 
conflicting ideas that people, particularly Newton and his followers, and Leibniz and his followers, had about how to approach the nature of space and time. Okay. The Newtonian point of view is to say that space provides a background, a geometry which is unchanging, against which you define the properties of dynamical entities like particles and fields and other dynamical entities who get their properties in terms of their relationship to this fixed background. Okay. Euclidean space for Newton. The other point of view of Leibniz is that there is no unchanging background. There is no space in the absence of matter and interactions and events. And instead, what you have are relationships between the things that fundamentally exist and fundamentally happen. Some of those relationships being coded into a property that we call relative distance or relative motion, but there is no absolute meaning to space beyond that. And Leibniz and his followers argued strongly for that, but Newton had the more successful approach as far as doing real physics, and so Newton triumphed at the time. But there continued to be a debate. Ernest Mach at the end of the 19th century contributed strongly strong arguments for the Leibnizian side, which then inspired Einstein to make general relativity, which is the triumph of the relational, we say it, or Leibnizian side. The modern language for this split, if you follow the literature or the blogs or whatever in the world of quantum gravity, is the Newtonian point of view is called background dependent. These are approaches to theories of space-time where there is a geometry which is a classical metric geometry that then the dynamical quantum entities like particles, fields, strings, etc. move in and the background independent approaches where there is no non-dynamical fixed geometry. Okay? Is this clear? Now, one reason why the problem of quantum gravity is so delicious and puzzling is that there's been a lot of success along both of those roads as far, at least until you come to the problem of quantum gravity. Ordinary quantum mechanics treat space and time as external geometry, as, for example, the coordinates of a particle live in R3 or Rn. The time is just some, the time on some external absolute clock, which is not part of the quantum system. Certainly quantum field theory on which, ordinary quantum field theory on which the standard model gauge fields and so forth are based, it says you have some fields in a particular space-time geometry, Minkowski space-time. So now we've moved to the world of special relativity, but we're still doing physics on a fixed background. And those approaches have been, of course, fantastically successful. And if I can say that everything, to my knowledge, that you all do here is based mm -hmm. on those successes. Okay. On the other hand, general relativity is cleanly in the other side, on the other road. And this is a picture here of a gentleman called Julian Barber, a physicist, philosopher, and historian in England who made the convincing case that convinced people in the field that the right interpretation of general relativity was as Leibniz and Mach had anticipated as an evolving network of dynamical relations, relationships. Okay. So we have a, a delicious conflict here, going back centuries. Okay. And indeed, the problem of quantum gravity must reconcile these because it involves putting together things from each side which have been very successful, quantum field theory and quantum mechanics on one side and general relativity on the other side. So it's not surprising that since people first began to study the problem of quantum gravity, these two directions, these two roads, have been taken. Now, before I tell you about them, there's an interesting thing, a little side thing that has to be said about style of research. And I'm sure people here in a research organization are familiar with the fact that there are different styles of research, different general approaches, and I want to say something about styles because the conflicts that I'm coming to describe are inexplicable, I think. That is, I tried to write a book that didn't talk about these and it didn't impress anybody until I started talking about styles. 
So it turns out that the background independent researchers, those who take that point of view, come through a legacy which you can trace through mentorship from Einstein, okay, which comes from the early part of the 20th century when scientists were more philosophical. The center of science was in Central Europe. There was the leading scientists were at home in the philosophical tradition, which they knew intimately. And the style was critical, individualistic, iconoclastic. Science consisted of independent thinkers who discussed and talked with each other, but took different roads. Okay. And that style produced quantum mechanics and special and general relativity, among other things. So it has a formidable set of accomplishments in the early 20th century. The other style was developed by people who were impatient with the first style when the first style bogged down in arguing about philosophical issues about did quantum mechanics make any sense or not. And a generation of people like Fermi grew up in Europe and then people like Feynman who really is the icon for it when science moved, the center of science moved to the United States in the 1940s. And these people were impatient with philosophical discussions. Let's stop talking about what's fundamental. Let's stop talking about Kant and Leibniz and stuff like that. We have a well-defined framework. It's mathematically coherent. We can calculate. Let's apply it to everything in nature. Okay. Let's shut up and calculate, as we were told in graduate school. Okay. This style has the best of what we think of, at least what I think of, as sort of what might be called an American style, at least as, as exemplified by Feynman, for example, by the generations of abstract expressionists that were the same age, the generators of, generation of writers. And this is brash, intuitive, swagger. Okay? Forget rigor, forget philosophy, let's just do it. Okay. And that style produced the standard model of particle physics, which is a great achievement. So we have a competition of communities with different styles. Okay. And these go along with different kinds of people. You can sort of characterize the pragmatic style of people you know, emphasize doing craft work rather than sort of trying to see ahead with philosophical ideas. These are independent. These like to work in collaborations. Kuhn called these normal scientists and these revolutionaries. There's a metaphor that Eric Weinstein likes, which is that these people are really good technical climbers if science is a problem of mountain climbing. And these people like to wander from the pack and get lost in the valleys before they discover new hills to climb. Okay. Julian Barber, who is the person who really understood the interpretation of general relativity, is an example of the survival of the first style, and he's somebody that I'll come back to. Okay. So, back to physics. Okay, I've sort of framed the discussion. We're going to see what happened along those two roads to quantum gravity. The background dependent road was, began to be developed as soon as quantum electrodynamics began to be developed. The first paper on it was by Heisenberg and Pauli in the same paper where they first quantize the electromagnetic field. And they say here, quantization of the gravitational field, which appears to be necessary, may be carried out without any new difficulties by means of the same formalism as quantizing the electromagnetic field. That is the worst underestimation of the difficulty of a scientific <laughs> problem that I know of in print. Okay? But that was the start. The first background independent approach and I did not know about this person's work until I was almost finishing this book, was a gentleman called Matvei Bronstein in Leningrad in 1935, where he did a PhD thesis, I think under Fock, if I remember right. Um, he was considered with Landau one of the two great hopes for Soviet physics, and in his PhD thesis, he disagreed profoundly. He said the elimination of the logical inconsistencies requires rejecting our ordinary concepts of space and time, modifying them by much deeper and non-evident concepts. 
Okay. Now, unfortunately, we never got to see if he would be as influential a physicist as Landau because the Soviet police intervened two years later and he did not survive. But it is the first PhD thesis ever written in the subject of quantum gravity, to my knowledge. So here's what then happened after Heisenberg and Pauli trying to apply the methods of ordinary quantum mechanics and quantum field theory to, with on fixed backgrounds, to gravity. Failure, failure, failure. And if I had a week, I could describe to you all everything that happened in all these failed approaches. Then there was a bright success in 1974, which is Hawking and others applying the methods of quantum field theory not to flat Minkowski space-time, but to the space-time of a black hole, found that black holes radiated with thermal spectrum, then nothing happened, failure, <laughs> failure, 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 and my career was starting and I was involved in various of those failures, and then 1984 string theory, which was an older idea and an older research program, but in 1984 the opinion coalesced that it should be properly interpreted as an attempt at a quantum theory of gravity. The other road, background independent, had more failure. Great people were involved in those failures. For example, Dirac spent enormous time in the 1960s on this problem. Um, and then in 1986, something called loop quantum gravity. And then a number of other things have been developed, which I'll only have time to tell you their names. Spin foam models, causal dynamical triangulations, causal sets, doubly special relativity, and so forth. So both of them came alive at about the same time. In fact, it's not a coincidence because loop quantum gravity arose out of a failed attempt to take the successes of string theory and move them to a background independent Leibnizian kind of framework. In fact, both loop quantum gravity and string theory come from the same basic idea historically and that's idea goes back to Faraday. If you know a little bit about the history of electricity and magnetism, Faraday conceived in the 1840s that electrical forces and magnetic forces were conveyed by field lines, which were stresses in the ether for him. And he wrote down equations to give the dynamics for how these lines would stretch between charges and between magnetic poles. Now then Maxwell came along in the 1860s and said, no, it's really a field the local field, the vector fields, and the field lines are just integrals of the field, but the field is really fundamental. But it turned out that when people tried to study quantum fields of electromagnetic field, and particularly of gauge fields, so gauge fields like Yang-Mills theories are extensions of electromagnetism where there are several vector potentials and there are additional symmetries and they underlie the standard model of particle physics. And people began to develop evidence in the late 60s and early 70s that the quantum fields were actually properly described in a language going back to Faraday that is quantum mechanically the elementary states were field lines. And quantum mechanically there are discrete quanta of field lines or discrete flux of field lines um, and those are sort of the basis quantum states of a quantum gauge theory. Um, and, so, and this idea was due to Holger Nielsen, um, a whole Russian school, Polyakov, Migdal, Mandelstam, etc. Um, and string theory went back and tried to do quantum mechanically what Faraday had done, which is describe the motions of these now quantum field lines moving in some fixed space geometry. And loop quantum gravity took the idea that the field lines, the quantum field lines make up the geometry of space for associated field lines having to do with the gravitational field. But they go back to the same roots of what we call the quantization of electric flux, or sometimes this is called the dual superconductor picture, because in a superconductor the, we know that the magnetic flux is indeed quantized. And so the idea is that maybe in nature the electric field flux for some theories is quantized. String theory certainly has compelling features. And even if many of us are worried about it now, in 1984 
many of us were enthralled and enthusiastic about it because to first approximations, it did some things dramatically well. And in particular, all the different kinds of particles and forces, the basic types that appear in the standard model of particle physics, chiral fermions, scalars, gauge fields, and the graviton could be understood by writing simple equations for the propagation of a quantum string in a flat space-time and studying the modes of vibration. Okay. We could use approximation methods called perturbation theory familiar from our studies of the standard model. And they made sense. Infinities that might otherwise have been there canceled at least, well, at the first order of approximation in 1984, then the second, and since, since 2001, to the third order of approximation, we know that the theory gives finite consistent predictions. The math is very beautiful, and there are beautiful connections to gauge field theories, which are helpful there probably for QCD and nuclear physics, whatever the fate of string theory as a, stand, as a fundamental theory. So there's very compelling reasons to study it. But there's a whole set of worries. And the whole set of worries come because making what I just said work quantum mechanically brings in some extra features, whether you like it or not. And I think of this as kind of a package deal, like when you buy a car and you want a CD and anti-lock brakes, and they throw at you cars which have that, but sunroof, you know, automatic locking doors, racing stripes, cup holders, leather, warming seats, etc. And you say, I just want those simple options. They say, you can't, you have to have the package deal. Similarly, string theory seems to come in a package deal. And the package includes six extra dimensions of space and extra constraints on the dynamics, which are called supersymmetry. And these are problems because these are not observed so far. And in more detail, let me tell you about the opportunities and the hopes and the problems that came up. Well, first, extra dimensions. The idea of unification through extra dimensions is an old idea. The first instance of it was 1914. Um, even as an alternative to general relativity, an alternative unification of electromagnetism and gravity, which was wrong. Experimentally, general relativity turned out to be right. Then, right after general relativity, there was the idea of let's extend to five dimensions and include electromagnetism as coming from the dynamics of the geometry of a fifth dimension, and so on. So it's a well-studied idea before it came again to our attention from string theory. And it had failed several times before. And the problems that string theory has run into are familiar if you study the history of those early attempts at unification through higher dimensions. So first, these extra dimensions, not to be perceived, must be dealt with. They must either be frozen in such a way that you can't see them, which is work of Lisa Randall and collaborators and um, Neymar Connie Hamid and collaborators, or they must be curled up very, very tiny so that you can't see them. So they're smaller than the wavelengths of the probes we use. Okay. The problem is that there are an infinite number of ways to do this, and this leads to an infinite number of apparently equally consistent versions of string theory. Because there you know, there's a huge freedom in closed or compact six-dimensional geometries, even if you put on some conditions that come from the dynamical equations of string theory is still an infinite set of solutions. The properties of the elementary particles, like the masses and the strengths of the forces, turn out to depend on the geometries of the extra dimensions and how they're curled up. And that means you get a vast, probably infinite list of distinct predictions for elementary particle physics. Okay. So the theory makes apparently no predictions for several of those big questions, elementary particles, dark matter, dark energy. Another kind of issue, which was understood by Einstein already in 1923, which is either it's a unification or it's not a unification. If it is a unification, then the extra dimensions are dynamical just like the three dimensions that we know about, and we measure experimentally their dynamics. And therefore, they won't stay curled up 
in, they won't stay, the geometry won't stay static and fixed. They will grow and expand until they can be seen. They will collapse to black holes. And also they will just oscillate, leading to oscillations in the properties of the elementary particles. None of these things are seen. And Einstein, this is a quote from Einstein in a letter in 1923 where he understood this already. It is anomalous to replace the four-dimensional continuum by a five-dimensional one and then subsequently tie up artificially one of them in order to account for the fact that it does not manifest itself experimentally. Supersymmetry requires that for each particle there is a partner with the same mass and charges but spin differing by one half a unit. That's not observed. It requires that the cosmological constant or dark energy, if it exists, be negative. That's not observed, it's positive. It implies that the geometry of space doesn't evolve in time, it turns out, but it is observed in the cosmology and with gravitational waves to evolve in time. So supersymmetry, if it's a feature of a fundamental theory, must be, we say, spontaneously broken. It must be present there at some short distance scale, but broken by degeneracies resolving themselves in the properties of the ground state. Okay, and of course, we're very familiar with spontaneously broken or hidden symmetries, um, but it's hard to study. Okay, so almost everything we know to any de degree of mathematical precision about string theory assumes the supersymmetry is exact, which means we're discussing models which disagree in these several ways with observation. There's a lot of discussion recently about what's called the landscape. So let's focus on the issue of the la what's called the landscape. So, and I'll tell you what the landscape is. Okay, so in 1984, string theory seemed unique, or almost unique. In 1985, it was discovered that there were hundreds of thousands of ways to curl up the six extra dimensions in what were called kalabi manifolds, consistent with supersymmetry going down to the scale that the LHC will now be probing. Okay. In 1986, Andrew Strominger, who's since become professor at Harvard, discovered that there were vastly more versions of geometries of the extra dimensions so many that he didn't know how to classify them or know if they were countable, and he worried very much in that paper that all predictive power seems to have been lost. Now, the response by that, at that time and for years after by many people in the field was don't worry. Eventually, we will find a principle that picks out a unique version of string theory and that will reproduce the standard model and give further predictions uniquely. Some of us did worry my first book, which is here, Life of the Cosmos, is an extended examination of what are the implications of trying to work with a fundamental theory which comes in hundreds of thousands or vastly more versions which give a vast array of predictions. And I tried to see if I could invent scenarios under which a theory could still make falsifiable predictions by which it could be tested. And that was what the first book was about. And there was a bunch of research in the early 90s to mid-90s about it. In the mid-90s, there arose the idea from Edward Witten and other people that all the different string theories were unified in one theory so that all the previously thought distinct theories would turn out to just describe different states of some more fundamental, deeper theory. And that was a beautiful hypothesis that was made that deeper theory still has not been found and it's something that a number of people, including myself, have worked hard on, on and off in the 10 years since. Okay. In 1998, the cosmological constant or dark energy was observed and found to be positive, which made all of the previously studied string theories irrelevant for a description of nature because it meant that supersymmetry could not be fundamental in the description. And then, in then there was a sort of crisis in which there was a lot of internal worrying. Then in 2003, Shami Katru and colleagues at Stanford discovered a technique to show evidence. And I'm choosing my words carefully. These were not proofs. These were not complete constructions, but evidence for string theories with positive vacuum energy. 
But the technique showed that if there was any one of those that really existed, there were at least 10 to the 500 that existed. So the issue of what I called the landscape of string theories earlier came to a head. There was no way to avoid it and appears to be no way to avoid it. And since then, um, in work of Washington Taylor at MIT and collaborators, we have evidence for infinite numbers of string theories. So the, here's the present situation. Present situation is that the reasons why the theory was compelling are still compelling. The unification is beautiful. However, there has not been a convincing, testable solution to any of the other four problems. In fact, there are no falsifiable or testable predictions which are proposed. There is no cogent formulation in terms of simple principles and equations that represent them. There's a lot of calculational evidence of various kinds which can be put together to point to a story of the existence of a theory that we don't know if it exists or not. And the theories, the only theories that we can study in any detail have this property of exact supersymmetry which disagrees with experiment. Yes? Spontaneously broken supersymmetry is a trouble. Oh, it's not a trouble if it could be made to work. And come back to me in the question session because I have about 10, 15 more minutes and some interesting things to tell you you'll know less about. But then come back because that requires a long answer. Okay. A number of prominent people like Steve Weinberg and Leonard Susskind have taken the view of embracing an old idea called the anthropic principle, that one should have a cosmological scenario which generates an infinite number of universes, each of which is randomly assigned, so to speak, one of these vast or infinite number of theories, and then you deduce from the facts of our existence properties of the elementary particles, because we have to live in one of those versions of the universe where intelligent life is possible. The problem with that, that is an idea that was already thoroughly studied and discussed and argued about by cosmologists, just philosophers and so forth. And I think there's convincing argumentation, which I can give if somebody wants, that there are no, or in extreme, maybe unphysical cases, a few such predictions that can be made. Because you don't control the properties of the ensemble of the other universes. You don't control them theoretically or experimentally. In the face of that, a few people, for example, Steven Weinberg and Leonard Susskind, these are justly very admired people, they're role models for me, which makes this difficult, have proposed changing the rules of science. Steve Weinberg says there are sometimes that there are revolutions in science and sometimes there are revolutions in our conception of science. And we have to embrace the anthropic principle. Leonard Susskind says it would be foolish to throw away the right answer just because it disagrees with, it doesn't conform to criteria of what is or is not science. Okay. And this is when the debate heated up. This is why there's a series of books, fights on the blog world, newspaper articles, magazine articles, and so forth, because this is a strong request from great people okay, that the evidence for a theory from theoretical, mathematical side is so compelling that the usual rules of science that require theories to make experimental predictions and those to be tested should be altered for them. And quite properly, there's a debate about that. Now, I'm not going to tell you how that debate should turn out, but I'm going to tell you what's more important, which is what's going on on the other two roads. And this is necessarily a brief, brief survey of a lot of work by several hundred people over the last 20 years, but the point of which is just to convince you that a lot is going on on the other two roads. So never fear. Things even that do make contact with experiment are going on. Okay. So this is just to sort of to introduce you to some of the byways down the other road. If you take the background independent road, 
then you end up describing quantum geometry in new languages which don't have some manifold or some geometry in which things are moving or are propagating in. And the main challenge, so you start with some purely quantum mechanical description of this quantum geometry, and the main challenge is to show that under appropriate circumstances, at low energies, when the universe is big enough and so forth, classical space-time geometry as described by Einstein should emerge and the Einstein equation should be approximately satisfied. This research program led by Renato Lowell in Utrecht has made the base case. It's something like the Ising model of quantum space-time. It's the simplest models that can be studied and through a combination of analytic and numerical methods, they have shown that when causality is incorporated, as in relativity, that is, they're among the relations that tie the spins in the Ising-like model together are causal relations, that something like a space-time manifold emerges. Loop quantum gravity is a, the best studied of these approaches. It's been studied since 1986. There's about 150 workers in the field around the world right now. These are just two of them, Laurent Freidel and Etera Levine, who happen to be both French. Um, recently, it's been, there's been a rigorous uniqueness theorem that shows that there is, with certain technical conditions, a unique way to construct a Hilbert space from unifying the basic principles, including the basic gauge symmetries of general relativity with inside of a Hilbert space and representation of an operator algebra formalism. And that is the one that we have been studying in loop quantum gravity. So there's strong, rigorous mathematical support. We know there are no ultraviolet infinities. We know that the spectrum of operators that measure the geometry of space, for example, the volumes of regions of space have discrete spectra, so they're as small as possible volumes, smallest possible areas. Recently, it's been shown by Ravellian collaborators that indeed the gravitational force is recovered at long distances. There's been a lot of work on black holes, entropy, radiation, cosmology, corrections to the cosmic microwave. And what these two people recently did is they completely solved the theory in a path integral presentation in a model which has just two dimensions of space and something very interesting came out that I'll be coming to. These techniques have also been applied to cosmology and there's been a lot of work recently. There's Martin Bojewald and Stefan Alexander, two of the leaders of that effort. What came out of the solution of loop quantum gravity in the case that space has two dimensions is something that we call doubly special relativity. And here there's an interesting story which illustrates the role of diverge, taking divergent paths. Um, you might, anybody, many of you in the room have studied special relativity. Did the follow, and you've heard about quantum gravity, you've heard that there's a scale, the Planck length, which is a very small scale, or an energy scale, the Planck energy, a very large energy, where you make a transition to a new quantum mechanical description of the world. Below the Planck length is not continuous geometry, there's quantum geometry. So did anybody ever worry about the fact that that seems to conflict with special relativity because there's no invariant length scales in special relativity. They transform between relatively moving observers. So some people, and indeed the first person who did this was forgotten was Snyder in 1947, but then the person who did it effectively first was Giovanni Emiliano Camellia and then Jean Miguejo and myself following on a little bit later. Um, found that you could resolve that paradox by saying, can we modify special relativity so that not only is there an invariant speed, there's an invariant length. And that's called doubly special relativity. And it leads to specific predictions, which I'll come to in a little bit. And that's Sabina Hassenfelder, who invented a version of that in which the Planck scale is the scale the LHC can probe, and she has experiments waiting for the LHC to test. Now, many people here are interested in quantum computation. It gives a new language for thinking about purely quantum systems deep in the Hilbert space where you're not close to a classical description. And some people have been using the methodology of quantum computation to study this question of how classical space-time can emerge 
from a quantum geometry, and two of these people are Focini Marco Pulo and Seth Lloyd, and there's been a lot of very exciting developments down that road. There's also been exciting developments down a road in which people imagine these quantum geometries as sort of like solid state systems and apply the methodology like quantum phase transitions to of solid state physics to trying to extract the physics from these quantum geometry theories. And two of the people are Gang Zheng Wen at MIT and Olaf Dreyer at Imperial College. And finally, one more. Alain Cohn, one of the great living mathematicians in Paris, um, who has his own approach to quantum geometry and quantum gravity by really deeply tying the notion of geometry and the notion of operator algebras together and unifying them at the level of the basic mathematical language. And that turns out to lead, you take the simplest non-trivial example of that and you get the weinbrick salon model of particle physics. Okay, that was the second background independent road. The third road, there's always been the third road. The third road is, look, all you guys are crazy. All of you guys and girls are wasting your time. You bore me to death because quantum mechanics doesn't make any sense. And the only way to solve this problem is to invent the theory that underlies quantum mechanics that does make sense. And that's the view of Roger Penrose, Gerardo Toft, a few younger people, here's Anthony, Valentini, and there are interesting ideas and interesting experimental proposals along the way, um, for example, from Valentini and from Penrose, because they have the gravitational interaction involved in the collapse of the wave function, and there are experimental implications for that. Okay. Now, how can we tell? This is science, so now I'm closing in on my conclusion. How can we tell if we're wasting our time? Okay. We are in the stage, it's a great period intellectually, it's a horrible period scientifically, but it's a great period creatively, intellectually, because you know, it's like the Cambrian era in biology. There's a radiation of diverse approaches and strategies for solving this problem. A lot of bright people, a lot of fun, a lot of great work, a lot of interesting connections with diverse areas of mathematics and physics. How do we tell who's right? How do we tell who's wasting their time? and who's not. We have to do experiment. Now, we used to say that that wasn't going to happen soon because an accelerator powerful enough to generate collisions at the Planck energy, which is 10 to the 19 billion electron volts, GeV, would have to be the size of the entire galaxy. And we're not going to construct, we can barely get the LHC funded. We're not going to construct that soon. Okay. In the late, and we used to say that, and Feynman used to say back to us, physicists make predictions, you guys make excuses. And one of the reasons, uh, an example that shows the need for diversity and independence and leaving a room for those young people with ambition and swagger is the story of Giovanni Molino Camellia, the same Giovanni I discussed, what he had done a few years earlier than that is say to himself one day in the midst of a failing physics career, look, there's got to be a way to probe the Planck scale experimentally. There's got to be a way to amplify small effects, tiny effects down at that Planck scale to observable effects. And he just forced himself to invent some and he did. So here's a couple of them. And the key is that we have access experimentally to something much bigger than a galaxy, which is the universe as a whole. And we detect on Earth photons and cosmic rays that have come from many megaparsecs, in fact, billions of light years, in the case of gamma ray bursts, across the universe. And if you see quantum geometry as something, say, discrete, maybe like a solid, this is just a rough metaphor, but it's one that the solid state physicists like, then you might expect that as a photon propagates through that quantum geometry, it suffers a small amount of dispersion, just like a photon propagating through a gas or a liquid. That dispersion is tiny, but we have 10 billion years for it to amplify. And that's the key idea, is we have access 
to the greatest amplifier in the universe, which is the universe. So, for example, doubly special relativity implies that the speed of a photon is a universal speed of light, but the speed of a real photon is larger than that by an amount proportional to the ratio of its energy to the Planck energy. And that's a tiny increase in speed. But if you take photons coming from a gamma ray burst over a range of wavelengths, and you let them propagate 10 billion years, by the time they get to the GLAST satellite, which launches in the next few months, the time difference is on the order of 100 to 1,000 of a second, and that's well within the electronics of the GLAST satellite to sort out. Or you look at cosmic rays, which have been interacting for hundreds of millions or on the order of a billion years with the cosmic microwave background, and in those, every one of those interactions, they're probing special relativity at extreme scales at extreme energies, extreme boosts, and there can be modifications in threshold phenomena and other phenomena which greatly alter the spectrum of cosmic rays at the highest end. And an experiment called OJ in Argentina is now taking data that is the highest energy and highest boost test of special relativity that's ever been done, and it's sensitive to deviations coming from quantum gravity effects which I would explain if I had more time. So there's no reason to give up on science or change the rules of science. Physics is progressing in the old-fashioned way through a dialogue of theory and experiment. One research program is in some trouble, but there's no reason to give up hope. And in fact, one can expect reports from Auger and Glast over the next two years that may confirm quantum gravity effects. Thank you. Yes. Uh, when you talk about dark matter, are you talking about uh, kind of conventional matter that uses black and so it doesn't create create so we can't see it, or is it a whole new class of particles that we don't know anything about? It is almost certainly a whole new class of particles that we don't know anything about because the density of matter needed to make the dynamics of galaxies and galaxy clusters work would take us a couple of orders of magnitude over what's called the nucleosynthesis bound. That is our understanding of the era of nucleosynthesis um, when the universe is passing through a phase where it's roughly like the interior of a star. Um, would not, there's a detailed theory of that which results in detailed predictions for various low atomic weight isotopes. And that theory would no longer make any sense um, if, if there were that many baryons in nature. Yeah. Sort of a hiring crisis in the top uh, near physics universities, especially in the U.S., uh, especially in regards to Princeton and Berkeley, and that almost all of their physicists are very strong string theorists, and that other disciplines or even approaches are being ignored. But what are your feelings on this, and do you see debating uh, it being fixed anytime soon? So I'm not going. I'm, I'm not going to address any particular university where friends of mine happen to work. Okay, <laughs> um, and but. Let me, let me give you a, 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 what I think is a useful perspective. Okay? So first of all, there is a hiring crisis, and there has been a hiring crisis in academic physics since the 1970s. That is, there's a vast overproduction of PhDs well-trained around, around the world in these subjects, for better or for worse. Before that, there was a linear expansion of the universities from the 1940s to the 1970s. And roughly speaking, there was room for everybody with any diverse set of approaches and ideas somewhere in the American academic system. And then all of a sudden, there's a narrow selection being made. Okay. I think what's important, to t and this is true in other sciences as well, okay. I think what's important to talk about in such a situation Rather than, I mean, I can say things in particular about string theory and so forth, but I think the important question is when you have narrowing resources okay, and high-risk activity, high-risk but very promising, high-risk, high-payoff activity, okay, how do you invest the resources that you have? And it's interesting to be talking about this at a you know, 
at a business funded research organization. And when I talk to people in high tech business or venture capital or so forth about this, the issue is obvious. So let me tell you what they say to me. They say the issue is obvious. You guys in the academic world are stupid. Okay. It's obvious that if you have if you face a high risk, high payoff challenge, okay, and there's five different strategies, okay, you fund the best people in all of them. And then you wait. High risk means good people are going to fail. And you don't throw them out because they failed, but you have a conversation about maybe you've been doing what you've been doing a bit too long. You should do something else high risk. Okay. Now, I'm sure I have friends in Silicon Valley. I know that it all is not rosy and idealistic and everything like that, but roughly speaking, there's, there's a sense of how you approach problems like this. Okay. And the notions of hedging investments, diversifying risk in order to increase the rate of return of your portfolio are bread and butter to people in the high tech world and venture capital world. And there's basic economics there and basic wisdom about risk means failure. You can't do certain things without high risk and that means that a large proportion of the efforts are going to fail. That's good. That's not bad. Okay. So, in the academic world, my friends say to me, okay, you guys should apply some of this wisdom. You should make sure that if universities, you know, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, hire people doing A, other universities hire people doing B, C, and D. Or you should make sure that in, the, in a university, if you have room for eight people in this kind of physics, you don't need eight people doing A. Okay? You probably just need three people doing A and graduate students and postdocs, so you have room for B, C, and D, and so forth. Okay. Did I answer your question? Maybe one more question, and then while you kind of people can ask Sure. And I'm very happy to hang around after, so. Yes? So, you mentioned one of the problems is that these 20-odd variables that in quantum mechanics, it can only be found out experimentally. There's no explanation about it. There. And you also alluded to uh, this multiverse that some scientists say there's as many universes as there are variable Now, uh, is there something in quantum gravity that would uh, explain these different variables or say, no, there's only one universe? So let me, tell you, let me tell you what I know, okay? Because there are two answers. There's the old answer, and there's a nascent, recently born, possible new answer, okay? Emphasizing that. The old answer is we are just going to understand how to consistently marry quantum theory to general relativity, and then we're just going to add whatever degrees of freedom experiment observes. We're not going to get involved until forced to in the issue of uniqueness, unification, and so forth. So most of the results in the literature on loop quantum gravity, the important results, are extendable to models where you can add any amount of gauge fields, chiral fermions, scalar fields, et cetera, supersymmetry if you like or not. Okay. So, um, so there seems to be as much freedom as there is in, in particle physics to begin with, which is a lot of freedom. Okay. Now, recently, um, in the work that I mentioned about quant using quantum computation model, Fotini Marco Pulo and a collaborator David Krebs, um, and before that with the collaborator David Poulin, developed an idea. The question is, why should, if, there, if a quantum geometry is fluctuating quantum mechanically and dynamic quantum mechanically, there are no symmetries intrinsically. Okay. So if you have a state which you identify as a photon, why should it stay quantum coherent as it travels through the quantum geometry? It should be like a photon in matter. It should just um, decohere its quantum information. But we don't see that happens. We build lasers and we send photons coherently. So what keeps them coherent? And she said, well, that's the same problem they're trying to answer in quantum computation. How do you build a qubit and keep it coherent as it propagates through a quantum circuit? And one way that people think about it, I mean, is to think about something called noiseless subsystems, that the dynamics of the quantum computer creates little hidden parts of Hilbert space that noise doesn't mess with. 
so that inf quantum information there stays coherent. And then she and David Krebs discovered that sort of generically in loop quantum gravity and a variety of other such models, spin foam models, there were these hidden pockets of quantum information. And they were kept coherent for the same reason that topological quantum computers keep information coherent for topological reasons. Because the graphs and the loops were curled up in, way, in, top, in certain topologies that the dynamics could not untangle. Okay. Um, then, or actually before that, somebody called Sundance Bilson Thompson, who is an Australian lattice gauge theorist, had made a little model of the elementary particles um, reviving an old idea called prion models where quarks and leptons have substructure based on a little game of braiding and nodding. Okay. And we noticed that paper. I don't know, nobody else did, but we noticed that paper because we were deeply interested in structures of braiding and nodding that are preserved, which we were trying to interpret. Um, so this is the beginning of an attack on the problems in particle physics from loop quantum gravity. That is, even if we don't put elementary particles in, they're there, and the simplest of them can be mapped to a theory of substructure of the quarks and leptons. Now, and that's gotten a lot of attention, probably too much attention, okay, because then there's a long list of questions that previous models of substructure of quarks and leptons fail to answer, and we have not shown that it, this theory does any better coming from quantum gravity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.